time now for our discussion zone as we connect with uh, Madam Vera Kari Kari Bediaku uh, from the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection. She's actually a Principal Program Officer at the Department of Gender. She's with us here on the Africa Daily Show. Hello, Madam. Good afternoon. Welcome. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you for having me. How are you doing today? Great. Yes, I'm okay by his grace. So, I believe you, you've seen and heard about the recent statistics about teenage pregnancy in Ghana. Yes, I have. Right. So, so what, what was your initial thought or reaction about this report? All right. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I must say that when the figures came up, hmm. when I first saw it, what I was telling myself was, wow. So what would the picture be like if all interventions that I know are in place now mm. were not there? And the other one was maybe we need to re-strategize and find new ways of addressing this women. So these were the two thoughts that came to mind. Mm. So, so by what you're saying, there are interventions put in place to actually mitigate you know, these you know, worrying figures in, in that space, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. So, so let, let's let's bring it down a little bit. Who would you say is to is to be blamed for this, you know, rise in teenage pregnancy? Are we looking at the parent here, or we're looking at policy by government, or both? I will put the blame on all of us. Mm -hmm. And when I say all of us, I'm not even talking about only parents or policymakers. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about each and every one of us as a Ghanaian. Right. We are all responsible. And so if there is any blame, we all have to take it squarely. Okay. Parents, policymakers, the media, and all other stakeholders, traditional authorities, civil society groups, and all that. We are all to blame. Mm. It is the responsibility of all of us. And so I would even take some out to say parents or policymakers. Every stakeholder, and in here, I'm even also talking about the adolescents themselves. Mm. We are all part of the problem. Mm. Mm. You made you made mention of the media, and sure. I mean recently we talked. We've we've been hearing. I mean we saw issues about how some of the contents are, are not properly being regulated, and all of that. Has there been any attempt by your you know ministry or department to to work with the media on some of the contents that are being churned out, you know, by some of this media house? Because clearly some time ago we heard about how. Uh, some actually during odd hours show you know these uh, movies x-rated movies pornography for short and everything but moving forward these things uh, per, per what per reports that they've been cancelled and they're no more showing or they've been banned and everything but have you made any attempt to try to work with these media houses or the regulators the nmcs and all that to regulate what they show of course, you know, uh, it, then it brings me back to my earlier point about the fact that all of us are to be blamed. Because, you know, as a country, we have advertising association and we have people whose role are to ensure that everything that comes out mm. on the public, the, like on TV or on radio, is sanctioned and is something that is good for consumption, especially when looking at the different ages that are involved. Mm. And so if someone's work is to ensure that all these contents are are actually reviewed and is the best to be put out there, okay. then I, I think everyone will be playing the role as expected and we will not get to where we are. But looking at it critically, our institution or the ministry for that matter mm. has been over the years engaging the media a lot in this regard. Right. Because as a, as a ministry, we even have a policy in place. We have a five-year strategic plan to address adolescent pregnancies in Ghana. Mm. And each and every year, we have two meetings, so biannual meetings with all stakeholders to track progress on how we are faring as a country. Okay. And almost every time we have this engagement, mm. we invite all media houses to the event okay. so that at the end of the day, we are ensuring that we create the right awareness. The reportage, the media should also be circumspect. Sometimes when some of these things come up, you know, when the figures are turned out, mm. we are quick to just come out and say, oh, this number of teenage pregnancies have been recorded in Ghana for this period. Right. That is not enough. Just by talking about it, it's not enough. Mentioning the figures, mm. we need to go a step further. And so that's why I am very happy that your institution, the African mm. Global Day, is taking it a, a bit further right. by saying that what are we doing to combat the figures that we are seeing. Mm. Because if you look at this critically, mm. between 2018 and 2020, there has not been 
he, he can even say that even the 2020 figure is less of that of 2019 and then 2018. Because uh, we are talking about 110,000 for 2020, but it was 110,285 for 2019 and 110,181 for 2018. And with these figures, those between the ages of 15 and 19 were always the highest with the teenage pregnancy. Right. So that we are talking about 107,023 mm. for this 2020 and 107,317. So comparatively, you can even say that the figures somehow hmm. are coming down. Okay. But what kind of reportage are we that We have to uh, avoid the sensationalism and talk about the issues and look at how we can solve it. Is the solution okay. that we are interested in. Okay. So when I say media, I mean use your platforms like you are doing now. Right. Try to engage and find better ways of re-strategizing. The things we are doing, if it's not getting us the results we need, mm. then it means you have to do something different to be able to get the figures we are getting right. or to get them down. Because someone will ask, all these numbers, if we were to report that we have done something spectacular for Ghana, how would we feel as a people? But now we are talking about the fact that all these numbers are teenagers or adolescents who have been engaged in teenage pregnancies. And it's worrying right. because... The resources, the scarce resources that we have, social amenities okay. that we have as a country are all going to be shared with these people who should have been in school so that we get the best out of them as a human resource, a force to work on with as a country. Right. So I think that maybe our parents, policy makers, we all have a part to play and every institution in there should be doing it big to ensure that. Right. We get the best out of our adolescents. Okay, you just mentioned some figures, uh, which I think they are much closer to each other. You mentioned twenty eighteen. Yeah. You said one hundred and eight or ten thousand. Just to be clear on that one. Twenty eighteen. Yeah, one hundred and ten one eight one. One hundred and twenty nineteen. One hundred and ten two eight five. But twenty twenty is one hundred and ten thousand. So if if you look at it critically, then mm. it means. Um, the 2019 figure was much higher than what we are seeing now. Okay. But it is still not something we would want to see. Exactly. The, the decrease has not been... Okay. The, the, mm. the issue is, why are all these adolescents or teenagers who are expected to be in school, in school right. and concentrate on their education, mm. engaging in sex at this early stage exactly. to come mm. up with pregnancy? Mm. Mm. And so we need to come together right. for certain efforts that are needed. Mm. I think, by stakeholders to right. ensure that we find a lasting solution. Right. I think I agree with you when you said that we all are, you know, uh, supposed to be blamed mm -hmm. in this regard. Yeah. Right. But but yeah. let's come to the issue. I mean, in recent times, we've seen reports from other, you know, African countries, especially during the, the time of the early stages of COVID, countries like Malawi and other African countries, uh, recording high, you know, teenage pregnancies. But some of the reasons here, uh, forced marriages, you know, defilement and what have you. But what do you think is actually the major contributing factor uh, to teenage pregnancy here in Ghana? Well, you know, um, you, you might not be able to, without um, really going into the statistics mm. and doing a study around the issues, you mm. might not be able to pinpoint the one with the highest. Okay. But I know issues around gender-based violence, and as you mentioned, uh, child marriage, Forced um, marriage sexual well. mm. uh, yeah, mm. uh, all those things are contributing to it. And you know, during the lockdown, okay. um, schools were also closed. People were in their homes with uh, their children, nowhere to turn their eyes to. And so, for instance, if you were in a, a place where you find yourself with people who, who are not really, I mean, considerate, then they can take advantage of the situation and then put girls in such situations. And so gender-based violence, domestic issues are also part of the problem. And, right. um, I, I think we really need the figures to actually ascertain for all these figures we are having, how much can be attested to gender-based violence, how much can be linked to child marriage mm. and all that. We okay. really need to have that statistic right. breakdown so that we can know how much is uh, alluded to each of the right. factors. You, you mentioned an interesting um, factor in there. You made mention of lockdown. Now let's go back to even the, the breakdown on regions. You know, at the at the top of the chat is, is Ashanti region. And I think at the, at the lock, during our lockdown period, Accra saw the most lockdown in major cities. But if you look at the chat, Accra is at uh, one, two, three, four, five, at number five. So 
what's the ratio here? Because Ashanti region is at the very top with about 17, over 17,800, you know. And, and Accra, where the lockdown actually really took place, is at number five on the chat. So is it really locked down? Or there are, I mean, Ashanti region, is, is there something there that we're not really, I mean, clear about? You know, I had mentioned earlier that you need to really ascertain why we are getting these figures. It, it's not something that you can actually give okay. um, a total uh, mm. picture to. Okay. You need to look into the region-specific figures okay. and then see the peculiarities with those regions right. for which reason they are getting those numbers. Okay. When you take um, uh, Ashanti region, for instance, mm. For all you know, the Greater Kumasi was also part of the lockdown, but then this is Ashanti region as a whole. Mm. So it is possible that even when you go through the figures and then you do the analysis carefully, you realize that some figures may be coming from outside Kumasi, okay. for which places there were no lockdown. So we might not even be able to um, attach those numbers to the lockdown. Okay. So there might be other causes. Maybe um, the kind of... Um, cultural setup they have. Okay. What, what happens in the evenings with uh, these adolescent girls? Okay. How are parents controlling their children? Mm. Mm. What are some of the pubs and I mean, sitting places available that children are allowed to go there unchecked? And okay. so some of these things might also be contributing factors. And, and so a proper study is done into the regional specific figures. You might not be able to pinpoint exactly what the because they might be um, locality specific okay. and so you need those figures there to be able to really tell the story or okay. give a, a clearer picture so I, right. I'm thinking that it, it, it's a, a, a combination of problems okay. and it may not be a one stop solution as well you need to look at the regional balance the different figures and then Tailor the responses to see what happens in every particular area of okay. the country. Right. L let's move away from, you know, the causes, effects, and what have you, and who's to blame and whatnot. Let's look about solutions. What is your um, department doing uh, to, to actually doing differently, you know, to minimize or to, to, to put a stop to this particular uh, rise in figures? Thank you very much. I had mentioned earlier that as a Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection, right. we, have in pla we have in place a five-year strategic plan that spans from the period 2018 to 2022 okay. to actually address the issues of adolescent pregnancies in Ghana. Mm. And we are doing this with major stakeholders like the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, and also some civil society organizations and, of course, the media. Right. And so by annually, we have meetings where we track progress. Mm. We meet with all stakeholders to just look at our strategic objectives, match it with the interventions that we are uh, implementing on the ground to see areas where we need to change and areas where we need to also enhance uh, our implementing efforts. And so as a ministry and of course as a department of gender, we also have gender equality clinics where we bring adolescents together from all over the country to a specific location. Okay. And then we take them through reproductive health rights and all the things they need to know about gender roles, mm. socialization, and I mean, how men should also be involved in the quest to achieve gender equality and women's empowerment in Ghana. Because talking about teenage pregnancy, right. the emphasis is almost always on the adolescent girl. But where is the boy or the man who impregnated this young lady? Mm. They are always silent on what happens to them and how we are getting them on board. Okay. So if you continue to always educate and sensitize the girls and leave their boys out, mm. then that is where they don't know what is going on. They will continue to be in such relationships with the girls that will bring about these high rates of teenage pregnancy. Mm. So we are actually also engaging the males. We have a he for she campaign. Mm -hmm. Well, we are ensuring that we get men on board to speak to issues of gender equality and to support women's empowerment. Okay. We are trying to get the boys straight from their onset to understand that we need to have a different form of socialization to be able to achieve gender equality as a country. So that growing up, if you are a boy, yours will not be only to play football and the girls will not also be from school to go and help their mother in the kitchen. We are all responsible. We all need to do whatever we can do to support. Mm. We are not limiting girls to specific rules and limiting boys to also specific rules. And we are letting boys understand the need to support the girls. 
sometimes it might amaze you that for simple things like menstrual um, cuts during menstruation mm. can even land girls into that teenage pregnancy because their parents, their families are not there to support them. We are also engaging the parents. We are talking to them about responsible parenting. We are trying to let them change their mindset on how they are to take care of the children at home. You know, sometimes hmm. parents think by putting money on the table, that is enough. Right. You need to get quality time with the children, hmm. speak to them, care for them, get attention for them, so that they can discuss with you every issue bothering them. That is the only way they can decipher between what is good and bad. When they go out, there are a lot on social media. Technology is giving us a lot of information. But how can they be able to differentiate between what is being taught in school, what parents are telling them at home, and what their peers are also telling them? And so we are also engaging the parents at traditional authority. Right. You know, some mothers have a very key role to play mm. in this. We are having, mm. yes, we are having cultural setups where we say, we need to initiate the girls from puberty into adulthood and all that. Right. Can we change some of these rights to just talk about the positive aspects of it to the children? Mm. Let, just let them understand the need to keep themselves stay in school and complete their education. Okay. Yeah. And we are also talking about hmm. um, implementing policies that will ensure that those perpetrators are brought to book. Most often than not, as I said earlier, we are concentrating on the adolescent girl who falls prey to teenage pregnancy. Mm -hmm. But we are leaving the men and the boys out. If they are the ones impregnating the girls, then we need to also ensure that laws work. Laws enforce, law enforcement are in place to right. actually punish perpetrators. Mm -hmm. So that next time someone will know that if I do this thing, I will not go to court free. And that will also put a stop to some of these things. Because for most of these young ladies, when you talk to them, they'll tell you it's unfair because the boy who impregnated them, they, those boys are still in school. And right. so if for some reason you are not lucky for you to get someone in the family to support you with the care of the baby, for you to go back to school, then it means your life has ended. Mm -hmm. And we have to also, as a society, start thinking about the children that these teenage mothers are bringing into the world. Okay. What sort of future are we getting for these children? Who, who no fault of theirs, they have come into the world at, at a time that the mothers were not ready. Okay. And indeed, the rippling effect in, uh, in your guest is as good as mine. So we need to tackle it from all these angles, and so that's what we are doing. Right. We are meeting all the various stakeholders. Hmm. We have program every quarter for them that we meet parents. We also have this gender equality clinic is for the adolescents where we take them through all the things they need to do. And then we also have the male engagement okay. where we are engaging the boys and the men on the part they need to play to ensure right. gender equality and women and family. So to mention these are some of the few things that uh, we are right. doing and together okay. with the media we hope that um sooner than later we will get lost figures if we yeah. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Madam Vera Kari Kari uh, for joining us on the Africa Daily Show, and we hope to engage you. Um, in the I hope the next time we talk, we're looking at uh, a significant decrease in the number of teenage pregnancies. Yes. Sure. All right. Thank, thank you. you All right. You're welcome. All right. The show is Africa Daily on Africa Global Radio. That was Madam um, Vera Kari Kari Vidyaku, Principal, Program Officer, Department uh, of Gender at the Ministry of Gender children and social protection uh, a very um, interesting uh, you know conversation we had right there well then yeah it continues with uh, us right here in the studios but you are welcome to join us with your thoughts comments and contributions as well through our facebook page africa global radio or on twitter af global radio use the hashtag for africa daily show i am barry musha and welcome half is here so we can uh, kick start half is how are you I'm well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Good I mean, to have you back. Yeah, 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 Charlie. It's <laughs> you, one of those things. Charlie. But anyway, teenage pregnancy. I mean, you heard a lot of uh, submission by uh, Vera Karikari. Yeah. Vidyaku. And uh, quite some in interesting points she, she laid out there. I mean, it was like she was listening to you mm. earlier when you were <laughs> advocating for the punishment of those, uh, you know, the, the male figure. Who actually the boys yeah the boys yeah. not just the boys but they are those <laughs> who do so so yeah uh, right I'll, I'll, I'll come to that in a bit mm. but uh, but I'll, I'll come to that i'll mm. come to that but uh to be honest i'm not so impressed with what's been done 
and I'll tell mm. you why. Yes, I'm not really impressed with what's been done. Now, here's the thing. There's a report we are talking about that was put together last year, 2020. Mm-hmm. And 2020, under the microscope, you realize that, I mean, now we talk about 2020, it's the year that the, the world was at home. Mm-hmm. And years to come, we are still going to refer to 2020. And in one breath, and in the next one or two sentences, we are talking about COVID because for much, uh, for a lot of the years, uh, 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 a, a big part of 2020 was spent in the room. So, I mean, we're going to talk about it. And speaking of that, I think uh, when you look at the numbers on this report, yeah, it's indic- indicative of, uh, of, you know, the sort of, uh, how do I put it? The extent to which the social damage that we have seen seen regarding COVID, mm. and it's it's just a tip of the iceberg. Now, if you are interested in numbers, let me just put. Now, research conducted by the United Nations Population Fund, that is that's the UNFPA. UNG. Mm-hmm. Now, along with Avenue Health, John Hopkins University, and Victoria University in Australia, now released in April last year, predicted globally there could be some 7 million unintended pregnancies during the global pandemic. Whoa. Now, look at this grim prediction. We are talking 7 million. Ghana alone, it's, 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 it's 110,000. Okay, this was a prediction of 7 million. Yeah. And by the looks of it, I think, uh, I mean, we would have surpassed it. I think by so. A mile. I think so. But yeah. look, I mean, we are talking about 100, uh, 110,000 just in Ghana. Mm. In Kenya, for the same period, we are talking about some 4,000 girls. And indications are that it could be more. Hmm. Okay? And most of the cases in Kenya was due to defilement. In a place like Zimbabwe, between just January and February alone, we are talking about some 5,000 girls. Okay? So the picture is not looking pretty when you, l- you know, look at it, uh, given the 7 million. Mm-hmm. I mean, the projection, I think, was just even being too kind. But you realize, uh, I mean, it, it could be more. But I'm not going into the negatives. Now, let's look at the solutions. I mean, she's, she's talked about, uh, you know, what has been done mm. so far. Which you were not impressed by. Yes, not too impressed. Mm. Because for me, all I kept hearing was education, meeting, they're having coaching clinics. Mm. These are things, I mean, these are things they've always, they've always done. About, yeah. Okay. Anytime teenage pregnancy comes up, oh, we are educating the parents. We are talking to people. We are meeting them. Okay. So beyond the talk shop, what happens? Mm. Okay, I mean, yes, in one breath she talks about punishing the perpetrators, but what exactly, what punishments are we looking at? Okay, even getting to punish them is not easy, and I'll tell you why. So, so, I mean, all I kept hearing was meetings and education, but for me, I, I feel, I mean, a lot hasn't been done, okay? It's all about meeting and still talking about it. And, well, they say insanity is, talk, you know what, doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Yeah. And that's what we're doing. Mm. Yes, this time I just, and it's a good thing you, you introduce the word different because you're asking just how different is the approach these days. Mm. And unfortunately for me, I, I just didn't get that. It, way was, it, was, it looks like it was the same thing being yes. repeated, being yes, recycled yes. every day. Exactly. We are meeting, we are talking to them. Different results. Now, talking about solutions, mm. now here's the thing. Here's what I think we can do differently. Okay. Now, looking at the solutions, one, I think we can, uh, one of the issues that has to do with teenage pregnancy that we're not looking at is the punishment and, you know, getting justice for these young girls to begin with. And that has to do with prosecuting these perpetrators. And that is not going to happen so long as we go through the mainstream courts. Mm. So I'm thinking, why don't we have specialized courts to handle these cases? To okay. fast track them, because you go through the mainstream course, what happens is that this, co- this, uh, uh, you know, these issues cont- will drag. Okay. And you know how you know the wheels of justice spin very slowly. Maybe eventually you get it, but I mean, it will come at a cost sometimes to your mental health. Right. Because and most parents do not want that. Mm. The girl is dragged up and down here and there while her colleagues are in school. Yeah. The family name is out is, there. Is out there in the press. Mm. Okay. Her name is all over the place. I don't know. So it's some sort of attention they don't want. So a lot of them, at the end of the day, they just sign an NDA and take a settlement, if that's even on the table. Okay? And just trash it out. And which, which, which is not helping, because it only emboldens perpetrators to, to go ahead and do it. Right. So if you're looking to punish them, I think it's the right time we, 
we look at setting up specialized courses to deal with these issues head on. Okay. Hmm. Now, another way I think we can deal with it is still on the punishment bit. Okay. Okay. Now, just now when we talk about even the cases of defilement, now, defilement is such a way that it's not something that is done by strangers. Someone sitting on the yeah. wooden. So people no. you're familiar with, huh? People you're familiar you with. You feel comfortable with. Yes, you've developed some level of trust with. And in the case in Malawi, where they reported, uh, in Kenya, that is, where a lot of the cases were due to defilement, it was by family members. People you trust. Look at that. <laughs> so it's not like some random stranger that picks you up. No. It's someone you know and live with in the community. You have to see. So just how much rehabilitation that even goes in afterwards mm. when you get to your perceived justice. Right. So I think it's a bigger issue in the end that we're not even looking at. Okay. And you see, looking at, at the core of this whole issue again is poverty. Something we are not addressing. We are seeing a lot of these girls move from the rural areas to the urban centers. Right. A crisis case in point. Okay. It's littered with, sorry, not littered, but we see a lot of, uh, you mm. know, uh, these sky eye girls mm. around. And all you hear is, is for business, economic for business. activities and everything. Yeah. And we see the conditions in which they, they, they are under where, where they sleep. Mm. So what is the ministry doing as a way of program to get these girls off the streets? To empower them because at the end of this poverty. Mm. Like you mentioned earlier where you saw, you know, a report that talked about taxi drivers and all these guys having their way with these yeah, girls. Yeah. So what's happening as a way of livelihood empowerment mm. to get these girls off the streets? and possibly get them back home to where they belong. Mm. Because at the end of the day, they, they have to feed. And they feel Accra like is where they'll be able to do that. Now, lastly, I think, now it's a good thing she mentioned society and all of us. Are to, be, are to be blamed. Yes, because, yes, on that score, I agree with her. Because I think as a society, we need to take a very good look at our, our perception of marriage. Okay. What it means as an institution. Because it's kept on a certain pedestal to the extent that I think it's, it's, it's looked at as the end goal. And so certain, certain, certain injustices are led to fly. Right. For instance, talk about this punishment. You have a, a guy that, you know, defiles a, 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 a young girl. And the punishment is, oh, marry her mm. as punishment. Who, who are you even punishing? <laughs> you are even punishing the young girl, yeah, if, if, yeah. if you are being honest. Mm-hmm. Because she's stuck in a loveless situation where that, that could potentially, you know, uh, you know lead to a, abuse, even. Right. So how is this punishment to the per perpetrator? But because you feel it's marriage, it's okay. Right. Another instance is teacher-student relationships. That has to be looked at. A lot of our secondary schools and what have you, these things go on, unchecked. Mm. Where... At the end of the day, because the teacher ends up marrying the young girl, yeah. they feel it's okay. But we seem to have just swept the, the predatory behavior under the carpet. Okay, things could have gone wrong in a number of ways if it didn't even end in marriage. Right. So are we saying because the teacher ended up marrying the student, it's cool. I it's mean, okay. When another one happens, oh, we'll force him Because to at the end of the day, I mean, I'm sending my ward to school to learn. Exactly. Not to get pregnant. Not get to get married pregnant by or get... <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> right. And you see, and lastly, lastly, mm. and it appears, no matter what, as a woman, no matter your level of education, one of the missus title is not in there somewhere. You don't get accorded a certain level of respect. respect. I don't know. It's like, there's this disdain that comes with, you know, a single woman. Mm. Because, I mean, without the missus title, I mean, you could end a PhD There's always professor. a question marks around it. Exactly. You, you don't have that title. You can mention him as Dr. Dr. Mamiaba or Professor this. You can have that PhD. Yeah, yeah like, okay, so where's your husband? All right. Are you married? That's why people start bashing for so, getting so that PhD. Yes, so in, in, in the case in Malawi, in, in certain instances where they recorded these child marriages, right. a lot of the young girls said, look, they got pregnant because after the young man was like, Okay, I'm going to marry you, so get pregnant for me. Then they get pregnant, and he's nowhere to be found. So marriage looks like the magic word to them. Mm. You see marriage, and it was like, oh, okay. Because, and if she was turning down your advances, then 
you get to have exactly. your way. So I, I just feel a lot is not been done in this space. Exactly. Yeah. All right, thank you. Half is the show is Africa Daily on Africa Global Radio. We're talking teenage pregnancy here in Ghana. But this is actually a canker that is actually, you know, in, in other jurisdictions as well. I uh, have his made mention of Kenya, Malawi, and, and other... Uh, places as well, and per the reports uh, by the UNFP, uh, uh, UNFP, right? Uh, I mean, the projection and everything about over 7 million people. Yes, uh, uh, just predicted that globally. Globally. Yeah, it could be 7 million you know, on Italy. Uh, and here in our base alone, we have 100, over 108. 110,000. 110, now, the interesting thing is, per the numbers, uh, she's saying they're educating and educating. Mm. Last year, Let's look at the numbers she put out. Yeah, so one hundred and ten thousand one hundred eighty-one. So for last year. Yeah. So twenty twenty, we are talking about one hundred and ten thousand. It was just around the same. Just around that same. How do you get me? So what is that? How do you get me? So let me now get my. Mm. So what exactly are we doing differently? It, it, it as much as maybe it it has brought uh, some level of change, but is is insignificant. There's no change, honestly. Yeah, I think mean, that's why one of the journalists here in Albany is Ghana was sure. very. Furious about the numbers. I mean, look at the the difference and all of that. But let me bring in Mummy here. Uh, she also gave us her take on a, a, a worrying figure that we have right here. Mummy. Bye. Yeah. So she talked about educating the parents. Mm. I think uh, it didn't come to my mind then. But when Afis was was giving his submission, then it registered. It's like, what are they educating the parents on? Don't allow your kids go out at night. <laughs> oh no, maybe. Because we find ourselves in a country or in a century where, or let me say, in a part of the continent where talking about sex with your kids is kind of like a taboo. Right. It's like you enter an African home and nobody's talking to their child about sex. Mm. And in as much as... Um, some of these kids get pregnant due to defilement. In as much as they are teens, there's so, there are some instances where the sex is consensual. Right. So, what are we educating? Are we educating the parents to talk to their children about abstinence, or what are we educating them about? Or don't let don't tell your child to play with boys, or yeah. none of them go out at night, or tell them um, if if you you get pregnant something will happen or i mean what are we educating the parents on because mm. the parents are the first people we should be talking to they are the guardians of these children mm -hmm. so unless we are telling the parents that teach your kids abstinence i don't see the point in educating the parents and then again sometimes we are talking to these kids about abstinence in schools right mm -hmm. but you know kids are kids what does that mean <laughs> they want to explore. It, kids barely listen. Okay. Right? And then there's peer pressure. Right. Right? So let's say, I mean, I, I have a group of friends. I mean, GHS. I have a group of friends. Then one day, some way, somehow, we find ourselves talking about sex. And then one person says, oh, I've tried it. The other person says, oh, I've tried it. And then, let's say I'm the naive one between those group of girls. Mm. And then I ask them, and then it's like, they, you know sometimes when you have these conversations with your friend, it's like you ask them and they don't really want to tell you. They're like, go ahead, try it and see. Yeah. Right? So then comes peer pressure. My friends know what it is. I don't. I don't. Mm. So then let me go and try it and see. Okay. So here's a, a child that has been, let's say, has been taught about abstinence. But because of peer pressure, they are, they are refusing to stay away. They want to go and try it. Mm. So if we are talking about abstinence, we should also talk about protection. Right. In the sense that while you are teaching abstinence, you should be teaching these kids about protection as well. Because okay. you might tell the child, don't do this. You could be in the, in the house with the child and you tell them, this is fire, don't put your hand in the fire. But you'll be there with the child and you hear a scream. And before you know it, they, before, bef you go and you check what's, what's, what is happening. And they put their hand in the fire. You didn't tell them to. Put Mom, their I have hand a question in. for you, uh, actually, okay. on the education bit. Okay. Okay. So, you you buy into the idea that yes, enough education hasn't been done. I'd say you know by parents, right? Now, when you talk about educating kids, so I understand where you are talking to your girl child. Oh, uh, abstain from sex because you might end up pregnant. The girl, children, the girl children, I'm the boy children as well. I'm, I'm, I'm getting somewhere with this. Okay. So, usually, the, the, the advice or the education is action and consequence. You, you go and have sex or unprotected sex, you get pregnant. 
Now with the boys. Now imagine yourself with parents. Okay, okay. Then you tell your boy child to abstain from sex. What exactly would be the consequence that you would actually preach to, to scare him? Because I mean, a lot of for the young ladies we understand pregnancy would scare them, but for well, a boy child, child I mean, what exactly would we put him off? If you if you are telling your son that if he gets a girl pregnant, you'd have to stop schooling and you have to work to take care of the girl and your child. Hardly, do you? I, I don't think that's scary to them. That should be because you because what is a huge I think I think for me, I think because because the the larger burden is on the female child. You know, number one, you're the one who gets to. If if that is if they even decide to allow you go to continue with your schooling, first of all you drop out of school, okay? You go through the physical changes that you've not experienced before. That's a whole different thing. Mm. Now that's another one that you you are you are you are yet to even face the trauma by your peers, you know your family, that name and and a whole lot of things. I so guess that's, but with a girl, there's there's a lot to lose. There's a, there's a lot of stake. So how do you it. make the boy child realize that he equally has a lot to lose in this equation? That I think punitive measure is just the way to go. You, um, you know you how? cannot punish mm -hmm. a boy child mm. who did not defile the girl. Okay. Right. Mm. Because in as much as they are teens, mm -hmm. he did not force I think I made, I made mention of this point. It was, no, it, it was it was it was a consensual. I have a problem with using con consensual nature. with you know I, kids that have no business I, even having sex to begin with. Fine. In so, as much as oh, what's concerned about children doing that? Really? What? What's what consensual is, about it? Where is he going? They have no business doing it. That's what I'm saying. Let's not even. They have no business doing it, but they are doing it. Exactly. It's not like the, the boy forced himself on the girl. They agreed. Yes. And they did it, and she got <laughs> pregnant. So, so as as uh, but, uh, uh, I mean, but they are supposed to be seen as children, and under the law, the assumption is that they don't know what they're doing. We have juvenile, what do you call it, uh, the, the, confinement er here. Call yeah, call, call yeah. yeah, we have that here in our base, yes, right? They do. And I believe these camps still exist. It's not a existence. camp. Is 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 a place? It's it's it's, it's a confined area okay. for juvenile. Right. What does that make it? And I, and I, and I, it's just like, it's just like, it's just like, it's like a semi prison. Why do you think it was, it was established? Hmm. Go on. For people on the rage who commit certain crimes, offenses in societies, right? Why do you think they are there? You know, and so sometimes it's more like a juvenile detention. Center. Exactly. Yes. So because what you've done is a crime. So if we have that, it means that if you're, if, if you're that young, 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 Dude, 16, 17, below the ages of 18, and you impregnate a girl knowingly. And you see, the thing about that is that look, we all know that this okay, thing so what is something that is frowned befitting. upon. Yes, going there, being locked up in such a place is, is a befitting punishment. Well, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but like I would tell you. If you're talking to a, a 60 year old boy and you're telling him about, you're threatening the child with marriage, mm. I think that should scare the child enough. No, it's because <laughs> marriage. Imagine, imagine me being 16. I'm a, I'm a 60 year old boy. And okay. then my friends tell me, do not have sex is not good. If you have sex with a girl you're pregnant, you'll be made to marry her. I'm 16. But you know, you know, I think you know, you know, you know, you know, but you know, sometimes the problem that we cause for ourselves, mm. we've 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 attached that sex element to and religion. The thing about marriage being used as a punishment, you see, we, man, you're we, not even we have, we have we have attached, we, we have we have we have combined that sex element with religion. So it's religion is spearheading that that thing. You do it is a sin. You go, to God will punish you and this and this and this. But we, I, I don't know. In the constitution, if you guys agree to have sex and she gets pregnant, there's a place where which states that okay, this article, even if you are underage, you're not above eighteen, you could be punished. All the time when you do when you have sex, there's not about oh it's a sin. It's a okay, sin. Yeah, That's like sense. the major thing. But half it says we should be sexual when immediate it comes to consequence here. Yeah. But like I was saying and I guess you drop unless it, 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 it is rape <laughs> or it is defilement. It is not actually a crime. Exactly. That's what, that's what we're saying. I don't want to say it was consensual because I don't want, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want kids fair from enough, half his... Fair enough. No, but if, if, if it was rape, I think the girl would, 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 would talk about would, would say yeah, it. Yes, so if it was rape, right? then it's punishable by law. Exactly. But if it's something that the two of them agreed to do it, why, then they did it. Why should you punish the boy? Why are you punishing the boy? 
Why why are they punishing him? Why is it punished happening? or not? He should be punished. Really. Why? He has no business having sex to begin with. So <laughs> why? 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 <laughs> why? For the punishment, so yeah, so the punishment should be given. Why do you think he has no business having sex? You should be downloading apps and doing all kinds of things. <laughs> you're you're no, not no, no, see, we are not hitting our feet. time. Well, we are not in our time. <laughs> Come on now. So like I, I was saying, we're out of time, if, so, yeah. if the abstinence talk is not working, mm. we should we should be mm. telling these kids about contraception. Yeah. I think yeah, because yeah. these days there aren't kids, in as much as we see them as kids or we see them as children these guys and as are. teens. I mean, <laughs> some, yeah. somebody would say something, and you from, would look from, from at the child and you're like, go, like, you think back to when I was a child, I didn't have this anything in my like head. that, yeah. So, in as much as education, if we are educating on abstinence, we should be educating on contraception as well because hmm. some people can cannot just stay away, <laughs> they just cannot. But then, yeah, thank you guys for joining on the conversation. It's all about teenage pregnancy. And this is not a one-day matter or a one-day issue. It, it needs to continue. And it's not just about educating the parents. Now, the thing is, if you're educating a parent who is, who is in quotes, illiterate, you know, to a certain level, who, didn't un- who doesn't even understand majority of what you're saying, so what's the impact, you know? So there should be more than just engaging, educating, educating. As a matter of fact, it should be it should be a caution to these young ones. I think here, yeah, uh, as they say, uh, what do you call it? Is this spare the spare the rod, sp- spare the rod and spoil the child and all? So yeah, let, let's let's do this together. It's not a one-sided element where one has to bear the burden of making it right, but it falls on every shoulder: the society, stakeholders, the media, you and I, and all of that. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it, subscribe, and share.